Good evening, church. Hey, there's somebody. That's a good thing. Hey, there's Alex. That's another good thing. So sorry. Oh, and there's Travis. Now we can really start. Yeah, I, we started with the countdown on for sure. We were, we were ready. No pressure. Well, good evening. I didn't want to put that to you. You seem like you had it very natural. It got awkward for about yeah, 45 seconds. Yeah, I hear you. Well, I make it awkward for about an hour, so welcome. We're glad that you're here. Glad that you're here at The Point. If you don't know me, my name is Travis James, one of the pastors here at the church and the pastor of this Thursday night community that we call The Point. Psalm 118 says, this is the day that the Lord has made, so let us rejoice and be glad in it. And friends, I want to remind you that wherever you are coming from, whatever your week has looked like, whatever today has looked like, whether it was full of joy or full of grief or sorrow or just frustration, we have an opportunity uh, tonight in this place here in this hour to press pause on everyday life and to just turn our attention to God. And so while that may seem obvious, I want us to be intentional about it because it's an opportunity where we can just come into this place. And even if it's just for an hour, just focus on what God might have for us this evening, listening to God's still voice in our lives or God yelling at us the message that God has for us this evening. And so uh, let us be joyful and grateful for that opportunity as we've gathered here tonight. We'll have an opportunity after worship to connect. I'll give you some of those instructions and invitations after the service. But I will say, usually now I say, stand up and, and turn to somebody around you, say what's up and greet them. Uh, but I will say real quick, before we do that, before we do that, not to make it awkward, not to make a joke of it, but it is flu season and there is stuff in the news that is panicking a lot of us. So maybe don't hug and kiss, not that we kiss normally or shake hands. Feel free to just fist bump or do whatever is, is natural to you. But let us stand and welcome each other in this place tonight.
favorite day and we've finally woken up, so that's fantastic. Uh, maybe this next song we can really get there. Come on, Chris, give me the beat. Okay, let's try.
you could be seated. Um, at this time, I would ask if our ushers would come and prepare to take our offering. And as they come, uh, I, I do just want to say thank you to uh, my good friend Chris Tamajan, my good friend Alex Branamore, Ryan Williford, who aren't always with us. But thank you all for being here tonight. Um, it's good to have you. Uh, uh, we should try something like this more often. It's I agree. Go, going pretty well. Uh, so anyway, but Lord, um, just take these gifts, use them and multiply them. Lord, if our gift tonight is just, just being here, uh, just the gift of thought, just the gift of time, just the gift of, of presence, uh, God, use that. The gift of talent. Pray. Gracious God, it is a, a grace that, that upholds us. It is grace that surrounds us. And it is amazing grace that reminds us that you love each and every one of us. God, tonight we're going to be focusing on your grace, a grace that is given and offered out to the undeserved, those who have not earned it. And it's a grace that that embraces us wherever we've been, wherever we are, and whatever we may face. And so, God, we ask that you speak to us tonight as you already have, and 
in this time of worship, Lord, but as we prepare to dig into your scripture and go through your word, Lord, that the message that we have, the message that we take away would be the one that you have for us and not the one that we want for ourselves. We pray this in Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen. So the scripture that we're going to look at tonight comes from Matthew's gospel, chapter 26, and it's usually several verses that we're looking at, uh, but I'm only going to look at two or three tonight. And so I'm going to read now from Matthew's gospel, chapter 26, and we're going to look at verses 14 through 16. So here now the word of the Lord. Then one of the 12, who was called Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priest and said, what will you give me if I betray him to you? They paid him 30 pieces of silver. And from that moment, he began to look for an opportunity to betray him. It's so short that I want to read it again. And so hear it again, Matthew 26, 14 through 16. Then one of the 12, who was called Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priest and said, what will you give me if I betray him to you? And they paid him 30 pieces of silver. And from that moment, he began to look for an opportunity to betray him. Friends, we are now in the first week of March, which means that spring is in the air. The start to spring is a couple of weeks away. It is just around the corner. And behind fall, which we do not get here in Florida, spring is by far my favorite time of year. Easter is upon us, the azaleas have bloomed, and more importantly, well, maybe not to Easter, but then the azaleas, we are in the month of March Madness College Basketball. The Masters is a month away, and spring training for Major League Baseball is in full swing. Yes, cheesy, but pun intended. Any baseball fans? All right, like two and a half people. All right, that's great. So, so baseball has started. Teams have made their way to sunny, sunny and warm climates like Arizona and our home state of Florida in anticipation for the start of the season. They're preparing for opening day. Now, spring training is usually a slow and uneventful start to baseball. However, this year has proven to be a little bit more interesting due to the controversy surrounding the Houston Astros. You all familiar with the controversy that has taken place with the Houston Astros? Yeah, all right, not a lot of baseball fans, but we know our controversy, I hear you. For those of you that don't know the Houston Astros, that's the team that was caught cheating throughout the 2017 and 2018 seasons. They're the team that used these cameras in the outfield to steal signs from the opposing team's catcher, right, allowing them and then later their teammates to know whether or not the pitch would be a fastball or an off-speed pitch. Right, whether it would be a 100-mile-an-hour fastball or an 85-mile-an-hour off-speed pitch, important information. And they would use archaic ways of letting their teammates know by banging on trash can, hooting and hollering or whistling to let them know if it was an off-speed pitch, and they would remain silent if it was, in fact, a fastball. You see, they were alerting the batter of what was to come. They were alerting the batter of what pitch they could expect. Now, as you can imagine, this was frowned upon by Major League Baseball, and so when the league found out about it, they did punish the team. They gave them a wimpy $5 million fine. They forced them to forfeit their first and second round draft picks of the 2020 and 2021 seasons, and they imposed a one-year ban on the Astros' general manager and the team manager. And after the league imposed this one-year ban, the Astros that same day decided they were just not going to deal with it, and they went ahead and fired both the manager and the general manager. But even with these sanctions that were implemented and even with the punishment that was offered out by Major League Baseball, baseball fans around the world have not been all that satisfied with the punishment, or lack thereof. You see, they wanted to have the World Series title uh, taken away from them. They wanted the trophy taken back. They wanted the title removed, and they wanted those rings brought back. And as a result, these fans have made it known throughout this year's spring training. Opposing team fans have been heckling and booing the Astros. They've been holding up signs that call them cheaters and frauds, calling them corrupt, and even fans and sports writers suggesting that the team change their name changing their name from the Houston Astros to this, the Houston Asterix. The Asterix being the mark that would be placed in the record book designating an exception to their title. The Asterix being uh, a mark of their cheating, being a mark of their deception. The Asterix being a mark that forever tarnishes their World Series title. 
Friends, you see, for the Houston Astros, this year's spring training is not just a time of preparation for baseball season. It is a time when this team is also seeking reconciliation. It's a time when they're seeking to have their franchise's reputation restored. It's a time when they are looking to receive a little bit of grace from not only Major League Baseball, but looking to receive some grace from their fans and fans of baseball around the world. We are in the second week of Lent, Lent being the season of 40 days or six weeks leading up to Easter in a season when the church finds itself in, in kind of its own form of spring training. Lent is a season of preparation. Lent is a season of anticipation. It's a season when the church begins to make that long journey towards the cross and gets itself ready for Easter. And like the Astros, Lent is this journey that we make towards grace. Lent is a journey that we make towards our redemption. It's a journey towards our uh, being restored and reconciled with God through Christ's sacrificial work on the cross. And also, like the Houston Astros, Lent is a season when the asterisks from our past and maybe the asterisks from our present day uh, remind us that we too are in need of grace. In our scripture for tonight, it's kind of like the disciples are, are in the midst of their own spring training. Jesus is preparing the disciples for the big day. He's preparing them for what's to come. He's preparing them for his redemptive work on the cross. And in this season of spring training, we are introduced to a particular disciple who has done the unthinkable. A disciple who turns out to be a cheat, a disciple who turns out to be a fraud, and one who, like the Astros, should have this asterisk next to his name, and one who is in need of God's grace. As I mentioned, our text for tonight comes from Matthew's Gospel, chapter 26. But before we look at our passage, I want us to kind of get caught up in what has taken place in Matthew's Gospel up to this point. At this point in Matthew's Gospel, Jesus is nearing the end of his ministry and thus nearing the end of his life. He has already completed his ministry throughout the region of Galilee, and he's already now made his way into the city of Jerusalem. This is kind of his final destination before making his way to the cross. And you should know that after he has arrived in Jerusalem, Jesus has been spending a lot of time inside the temple. He has been teaching the crowds that have gathered. He has been proclaiming the kingdom of God. And large crowds are there to listen to him. Large crowds have gathered around in the temple to listen to him speak. But while there are some who are there and hanging on to his every word, some of the religious leaders in the area remain skeptical. Some of the religious leaders are uh, resistant and they have some concerns about this king that is just paraded into their city. And if we look at Matthew chapter 26, verses 1 through 5, we get some additional details that kind of fills in some of the context of what's taken place here in Matthew 26. The first two verses of Matthew 26, uh, Matthew tells us this, when Jesus had finished saying all these things, he's been teaching, he's been talking with them about the kingdom of God, he said to the disciples, you know that after two days the Passover is coming, and the Son of Man will be handed over to be crucified. All right, so we're told here at the start of Matthew 26 that the Passover festival was approaching and that it is two days away. I've mentioned it before, and some of you already know, Passover being that major Jewish festival that is held every year commemorating the Israelites' freedom, their liberation from Egyptian slavery which means that we can assume that the city is filled with people. There are thousands of pilgrims that have journeyed into the city of Jerusalem for this annual celebration. The city is packed. There are crowds everywhere. And Jesus has pointed to the fact that the Passover festival is two days away, and then he has also uh, predicted his upcoming crucifixion. Picking up in verse 3, Matthew goes on to write, Then the chief priests and the elders of the people gathered in the palace of the high priest, who was called Caiaphas, and they conspired to arrest Jesus by stealth and kill him. But they said not during the festival or there may be a riot among the people. The chief priests and the elders of the people, they gathered at Caiaphas' palace and they conspired to arrest Jesus by stealth and to kill him. So here at the start, we're not only told about the Passover, we're not only told about uh, the crucifixion that is uh, just around the corner, but we're also told that these chief priests and these elders have gathered at Caiaphas' house, and the reason they have gathered is to conspire against Jesus. They're looking for ways to get him. 
They're looking for ways to get him in trouble with the Roman authorities, and they're talking through options. They're discussing possibilities and looking for the best opportunity that they can grab to have him arrested and eventually killed. But they say, but fearing what the crowd might do, how they might react, and the riot that might ensue, they've decided not to do it during the festival. All right, so that kind of fills it in just a little bit as far as what has taken place after Jesus has arrived in the city of Jerusalem, what he's done, what he's preparing for, and what the religious leaders in the area are doing at the same time. The scene is pretty tense, right? People are kind of on the edge of their seat waiting and wondering what is going to happen. And in the verses that follow, the intensity picks up. And it picks up as Matthew turns his attention towards one particular disciple, one of the 12, who was called Judas Iscariot. Now, up to this point in Matthew's gospel, Matthew has not talked a whole lot about Judas. Unlike some of the other disciples that Jesus has called and invited to follow, Matthew does not give us any any background information about Judas. We don't get his call story of what he gave up, what he was doing for a living, what he gave up to follow Jesus There's no details around who this guy is and what he's done and and any information about him up to this point. And we get that here at the start of this this text. And all that Matthew tells us in this passage is that Judas, whose surname is Iscariot, is one of the 12. He's one of the 12 disciples who's followed Christ throughout his life and followed Christ throughout his ministry. All right, and so at first glance, as we're introduced to Judas, uh, it's safe for us to assume that uh, being one of the 12, that at some point he had encountered Jesus' teaching, he's encountered Jesus performing these miracles, and that at some point he had heard this good news. He'd heard the gospel that Jesus was proclaiming, and he was transformed by the good news of the gospel. Being one of the 12, it's safe to assume that at some point he made the same decision as the other disciples to drop everything and to follow Jesus, not only as rabbi, as teacher, but as Lord. You see, by telling us that Judas was one of the 12, we can assume that he was in Jesus' inner circle. We can assume that Judas was part of Jesus' closest network of friends. But then things get a little bit interesting in verse 14, which is the verse that I started out with us tonight. And in verse 14, after this basic introduction to Judas, Matthew goes on to tell us that Judas went to the chief priest and said, what will you give me if I betray him to you? Judas went to the chief priest and said, what will you give me if I betray him to you? That question is one that I want us to hold on to and think through and take with us tonight. What will you give me if I betray him to you? Judas, one of the 12. Judas, one of the disciples, one of Christ's followers, makes his way to the chief priest. Remember, they are the religious leaders who are plotting against Jesus. They are the ones who are conspiring to arrest and to have Jesus killed. Judas goes to them and he asks them this question. A question that is more of an offer than it is a request. It's a question that's more of a proposition than it is a formal plea. He asks them, what will you give me if I betray him to you? What will you give me if I turn him over to you? Here in verse 14, Judas makes it known. Judas, this disciple, this follower of Christ, he makes it known that he's willing to betray Jesus. Judas makes it known that he's willing to betray him for the right price. While he, while he may have been one of the 12, while he may be in the inner circle, Judas makes it known that he's willing to turn his back on Jesus Christ, depending on what's in it for him. And from this point on, as we're reading the scripture, the church and, and people who are reading the Bible everywhere, from this point on, Judas' reputation would forever be tarnished. From this point on, he would not be uh, known for and remembered for being this faithful follower of Jesus Christ. He would not be known for his commitment. He would not be known for his sacrifice and his faith in Christ. And he would not be known as this worthy and upright disciple. Instead, Judas would only be known for his betrayal. Judas would only be known as the one who turned his back on Jesus, the one who consulted with the chief priest, the one who looked for ways to betray Jesus, and the one who was willing to hand him over to the authorities or turn him in. 
One could say that from this point on, Judas receives that asterisk next to his name. He's become a fraud. He's become a scam, a liar and a cheat, asking the chief priests, what will you give me if I betray him, if I turn my back on him? Now, I'm going to go out on a limb, and I'm going to assume that none of us in here would say, if we were asked who is our favorite disciple, that all of us would at one time kind of shout out Judas, like he's our, our favorite one. I would imagine that none of us in here would look to Judas as the example for us to follow. If we were to say, who is the model disciple? What does it mean to follow Christ? I doubt we would point to Judas in the Bible. Now, I would imagine that none of us in here would liken ourselves to Judas, to liken ourselves to this betrayer, to this fraud, this disciple who was willing to turn his back on Jesus Christ for the right price. But friends, the truth is, whether we like to admit it or not, I think we're all susceptible to being like Judas in one way or another. I think we're all susceptible to being enticed by other voices, either the voices uh, within us, the the voices that, that lead us in a certain direction, or the voices of those around us. I think we're all susceptible to being enticed by other motives and by outside wants and ambitions. I think we're all susceptible at one point or another to letting our own feelings, our our greediness, our selfishness to creep in, letting our preferences become the priority. I think we're all susceptible to allowing something other than Jesus to become the focus of our minds and allowing something other than Jesus to become the focus of our hearts. Friends, at various points in time, at various points in our lives, I think we all ask this question, what will you give me if I turn away? Christ. And while we're not asking this question to the chief priests, I think it's a question that we are continually asking, either intentionally or unintentionally, consciously or subconsciously. We're asking this question to anything and everything that competes for our affection to Christ and anything and everything that competes to our commitment, with our commitment to Christ. What will you give me if I turn my back, if I turn away? I think it's a question that some of us ask in our jobs. I think some of us ask this question with our careers, or we ask this question in our relationships, or we ask it with money, with our pastimes, free times, things that we do. You see, it's a question that asks, what do you have to offer me that will satisfy my wants and my desires? It's a question that asks, what do you have to offer me that's more enticing, more fulfilling than what Christ has to offer me? It's a question that asks, what will you give me if I turn to you instead, if I give you all of my attention and turn away from Christ? It's a question that asks, what will you give me if I place my loyalty in you, if I make a commitment to you and prioritize you, placing you above Christ? What will you give me? And friends, Matthew tells us that it didn't take all that much for Judas. You see, Judas didn't require a whole lot to turn his back on Jesus the Christ, on the Messiah, on the Savior. Verse 15 tells us that they paid him 30 pieces of silver. 30 pieces of silver, which is an insignificant price considering. 30 pieces of silver, which is an insignificant amount of money, said that they paid him 30 pieces of silver. And from that moment... From that moment, he began to look for an opportunity to betray him. Now, friends, I know that it's not all that fun and encouraging to liken ourselves to Judas. This isn't one of those kind of pep rally, hooray for us, kind of Christian messages that gets us all excited. But I think it is important to give it some consideration. I think it's important to consider the ways that we might be a little bit like uh, Judas, especially in this time of Lent. And the reason I believe so is because I think it makes what happens next in the gospel, it, it makes what happens next in the story that much more meaningful and that much more significant, not only for Judas, but for us. You see, I think it's important to liken ourselves in some way, in whatever way we can or might be able to, whether we like it or not, to Judas because I think it helps to prepare us to not only receive, but to embrace and to appreciate the grace that is about to be made known and extended. Grace that is extended in the form of a meal, a meal that is described in the verses that follow our passage for tonight. 
If we were to continue reading through Matthew's gospel, chapter 26, and looked at verse 19, we would see that Matthew explains, so the disciple did as Jesus had directed them, and they prepared a Passover meal, the Passover meal being the sacred meal in the Jewish tradition. It goes on to say, and when it was evening, he took this place with the 12. Notice there are 12 there at the table. When it was evening, he took his place with the twelve, and while they were eating, he said, Truly I tell you, one of you will betray me. And they became greatly distressed and began to say to him, one after another, Surely not I, Lord. This is very awkward table conversation at a supper. Jesus sits down with the 12, his disciples, and he says, one of you is going to betray me. And they get unsettled. They start to get kind of concerned. It says they are greatly distressed. And they began to say to Jesus, one after another, surely not I, Lord. But in verse 25, we're told that Judas, who had already betrayed him in his heart, Judas said, surely not I, Rabbi. You see, he had known what he had already done, but he went along with the other disciples, and he was pretending to be shocked. Judas denied the possibility that he would be the one to turn away from Jesus. Judas uh, dismissed the idea that he would be the one to turn his back on Christ. He rejected the thought that it would be him, Judas, the disciple who would betray Christ. And in the last part of verse 25, Jesus replies to Judas saying, you have said so. Which you could read as Jesus being like, all right. But it's actually better translated to be Jesus saying, yes, you, Judas. When Jesus says, one of you is going to betray me, Judas said, surely not I, Rabbi, meaning teacher. And Jesus says, yeah, you, Judas. But then listen to this, knowing what was to come, knowing what was about to happen, knowing what Judas was about to do afterwards, they continue to share this meal together, what would become their last supper together before Judas betrays Christ. And picking up in verse 26, Matthew tells us that while they were eating, Jesus took a loaf of bread and he had given thanks and he broke it and he gave it to them saying, this is my body which is given for you, do this in remembrance of me. And then Jesus took the cup, and after giving thanks, he gave it to them, and he said, drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, some translations say the new covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. They're sharing in this Passover meal. Jesus is instituting the Lord's Supper. He's instituting what we understand as Holy Communion. And through this meal, Jesus is setting the stage for their redemption. It's through this meal that Jesus points to his mercy. It's through this meal that Jesus points to his sacrificial love. It's through this meal that Jesus points to his forgiveness. And it's through this meal that Jesus extends his grace. And while it may be obvious, and while I have already pointed to the fact that there were 12 around the table, I want us to highlight who was there with him. I want us to highlight who was invited to share in this meal with Jesus and the other faithful followers of Christ. I want us to highlight and focus in on who was invited to be present at the table. And who was it? Judas. Judas, the betrayer, he got an invitation to. Judas, the one who had gotten it in his heart to turn away from Christ, he was sitting there with the other disciples. Judas, the one who had worked out this deal to turn Jesus over to the authorities, he was right there with them, breaking bread, sharing this meal. Friends, Jesus made it clear that even Judas was welcome at this table. The one who had messed up big time was welcome. The one who had gotten off track severely was welcome. The one who had turned his back on Christ for something more enticing, something better, something more self-serving was there. This imperfect follower, this imperfect uh, disciple of Christ was invited to draw close to Jesus, yes, in his imperfection, and was invited to receive the mercy and the grace that was being offered through the bread and the cup. Judas was invited to get a taste of this redemptive work and abundant grace that Christ was preparing to offer out not only to them, but to the world on the cross.
Judas was invited to come to the table and experience Christ's mercy and receive Christ's grace. And friends, the good news that we find in this text and the good news that I want us to embrace and hold on to tonight is that Jesus extends the exact same invitation to each and every one of us. Regardless of where you find yourself tonight, regardless of what's been, regardless of the past, regardless of today, even regardless of the hour uh, before you stepped foot here in this church, Regardless of what's to come, you are invited to come and receive God's grace through the bread and the cup. Regardless of what took place years and years ago, regardless of whatever it was that put that asterisk next to your name or whatever is threatening to do so in the future, Christ our Lord invites each and every one of us in our imperfections to come forward and to receive mercy and to receive grace in the form of the bread and the cup. And so that is what we are going to do tonight, and that is how we are going to end. And so I want to invite the band to come back up and those who are going to be assisting with communion to come forward, and I'm going to give you some instructions as we proceed. There are going to be two stations um, here at the front, so if you are on uh, my right side, you'll be invited to come forward down this side. If you're on the left side, come this way. There'll be two stations and what we're going to do, we're going to do it a little bit differently and kind of jokes aside. We normally do it by intention, which means you'll, you'll take a piece of bread and dip it in the cup. But tonight, what we're going to do, just seeing that it's flu season and, and there's some stuff on the news that has us a little concerned, you'll notice that we're getting some hand sanitizer going and we're preparing and the servers are actually going to hand you a piece of bread. You're still going to be invited to dip it in the cup. You don't need to dip it all the way down in. You don't need to kind of sop it up like cheese dip. You just need to kind of dip it in and then partake. And so we want to invite you to do so and then invite you to spend some time at the altar or return to your seat. Is there anything else I'm forgetting? Well, I guess just a reminder that that as long as you uh, earnestly repent of your sin and you seek to live at peace with God and with one another, Christ says, come. Christ says, come and receive and embrace this grace that I've offered you. Come and receive this grace, this mercy, this sacrificial love that is poured out and offered out to you on the cross. And friends, as we come forward and as we celebrate Holy Communion, I want you to reflect on the grace that is needed in your life. We all need grace. Regardless of our resumes and our stories, we're all in need of God's grace, not only today, but in the days ahead as we journey to the cross. And so as you are ready, uh, as we get set up, I want to invite you to come forward and accept this invitation that Christ offers to each and every one of us.
Friends, this message of grace that is, is offered to us through Christ's redemptive work on the cross is, is the grace that we receive from what we've come from. I've made that clear hope that I have, but it's also a grace that sustains us and moves us forward in whatever we face. And so as we as a community, as we make this journey through Lent, as this season of, of anticipating and preparation towards Easter, let us not just embrace this grace and understand the meaning and the significance of Easter, but let us share that with the people around us. Let us own it for ourselves. Let us, let us embrace it in the way that we need to, but let us also go and share this and let this be the message that we offer to the world, the meaning and the significance of the cross, that it's not just a uh, time for the masters and for March Madness and baseball season, but there is important work that God had planned and that God has planned as we journey to the cross. And so I'm so glad that you're with us tonight. It was a good evening of worship. Hope you'll join us. If you're new with us, uh, glad that you're with us. I hope you'll join us again next week. We do this each and every week, Thursday night at 6.30 here in this place. I've got just a couple of announcements for you as we close. If you're here for Celebrate Recovery, uh, you're in the right place. It begins immediately following worship. We have a men's group and a women's group. There's an information table over to your left. Feel free to stop by and get some information about Celebrate Recovery. Uh, For those of you that are not there here for Celebrate Recovery but want to connect, we want to invite you to make your way downstairs to what we call Connection Point. There's some cold brew coffee downstairs. There's fresh baked cookies. And we want you to go down there and just to connect with some of the folks that you've been sitting with in worship. So there's a a teacher appreciation luncheon tomorrow that we're doing at Fairmount Park Elementary School. If you know that we have been walking alongside them as a community here at the point, and we've done four teacher appreciations last year, tomorrow is our second one of the year. And so just ask for your prayers. If you're interested in helping out at any time, ask some questions downstairs in Connection Point. But if you're not able to make it or unable to help, just want you to be prayerful for that school, for their teachers, for their entire community as we continue to walk alongside them and love on them. That's all I got as far as announcements go. And so at this time, I want to invite you to stand. We close out in prayer. So let us go out saying the serenity prayer. The words will be on the screen. God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference, living one day at a time, enjoying one moment at a time, accepting hardships as a pathway to peace, taking as Jesus did the simple world as it is and not as I would have it trusting that you will make all things right if I surrender to your will so that I may be reasonably happy in this life and supremely happy with you forever in the next. Amen. We'll see you next week.